Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Audio Signals podcast, where we talk about stories, storytelling, and uh, we kind of look into the story of the storytellers uh, himself, herself, or itself, if it's, I don't know, artificial intelligence, if I ever get to <laughs> interview that one. Um, I have a pretty good relationship with it. Uh, I don't know if we will talk a little bit about that. I, I like to touch on technology and uh, and creativity here and there. So to get the opinion of of an experienced writer, like, uh, like the one we have today here, if you're watching the YouTube uh, video, you can see he's uh, J.V. Hilliard. Say hello. And uh, hello. if you're listening, yep, you just heard him say hello. So I'm going to cut it short because I, I, it's, it's the genre that I love. It's fantasy. I was just talking to John before I started recording that when I was a kid. I think the year was 1977, so I was really a kid. Uh, one of my one of the reasons why I fall in love with uh, with fantasy, I think, it was the the Sword of Shannara and then the old trilogy, which is more than a trilogy anyway. It, it became an entire world. And uh, yeah, Terry Brooks. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But this is not the person we're interviewing today. It's not Terry Brooks. It's JMB <laughs> Healard. And uh, welcome to the show. I'm excited about this conversation. It's a pleasure to ha uh, be on. And thank you very much for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Oh, it, it, it's, a, it's a great uh, occasion for me every episode to kind of pick the brain of storytellers i mean storytelling is something that that i love in many many different forms and i always like to start with we're all made of stories some people actually write them some people turn them into <laughs> movies and uh, games or all of the above and some other people just tell a story to their kids and uh to their friends and that's that's how we made our society that's how we build it so enough about this uh, but i like to kind of like make a a presentation or a picture about what we're going to what we're going to see and and tease the conversation but it's time to dive into it and uh, let's start with uh, my favorite question who is jv Eliard? well i i it's real simple i uh i fell into authorship a few years ago when covid provided me the opportunity to write the novel that's been rolling around in my head for 20 years i i've always been a fan of the genre same with you I read sort of Shannara when I was in middle school and um, all the way up to the, you know, the uh, fall of Shannara, uh, the most recent book a couple of years ago, big fan of, of Lord of the Rings and Game of Thrones and anything in between. Um, and what really got me even more deeply involved in the genre was playing Dungeons and Dragons for many years. I still do to this day. I've been playing for about 20 years with my friends. We now do it online um, on Sundays and, and still get together. Uh, when we all have a chance to. Uh, but, you know, up until COVID, I was a defense lobbyist. I was doing work in D.C., primarily with tech and defense companies, working with the Pentagon, with Congress, with the White House, to various departments and agencies, and always wanted to do this. Uh, and then when COVID happened, D.C. shut down for almost 18 months. There was nothing to do. And I was sitting at my house, and I, my wife's uh, looking at me like, you're not going to sit around. You're going to drive me nuts. Do something. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so that something happened to be writing what I thought was going to be a standalone novel. And as fate would have it, through iterations of editing and finding a publisher, um, I was asked to commit to writing a series, which is very typical in fantasy adventure genres. And then everything kind of took off from there. So I made a more than a, I would say, a 180 degree turn, you know, from what I did daily to what I'm doing now, which is, you know, story writing and having a good time telling people about all the crazy stuff that rolls around in my head. And a lot of that comes from reading the sort of Shannara or reading the Shannara or, or watching those movies you mentioned before, playing video games. Uh, you know, it, it, it comes from that and just having a wild imagination and then having the time to write it and then seeing it succeed. Uh, and that's allowed me to, to kind of get through my series. You know, it, it's amazing because uh, I have a list of about probably more than 100 people that I need to reply for this particular show. The other one is more the, the, the daily job, the technology and society one, so I, I'm more responsive to this, but this I really enjoyed. In the last few conversations that I had with authors, they're all, they, ne they were never authors or writers from the get-go, right? They, 
One uh, of the last was a, 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 a military pilot, uh, also a trial lawyer. Uh, then I had somebody that was a neurosurgeon. And all of a sudden, they, they have this in the back of their mind. And it's I, I, now let's go there. I, I think everybody I'm going to I'm going to quote Ratatouille here, the Disney movie. It's uh, everybody can cook. <laughs> and there is a question mark with that. Like everybody can write or everybody can tell a story. Right. Um, I think it's a matter of, you know, at what level you, you write. And you, do you think that kind of true, that, that statement? Um, what's your thought on that? Well, I think everybody has a story or stories to tell. Not everybody is capable of doing it the way that they want to have it done. And, and it's nothing against a person or not. You know, I would love to play in the NFL. I just can't <laughs> do that, right? You know, and as much as I love football, uh, it's never going to happen. You know, so you can play football. Talent. You're just not going to play in the NFL, right? <laughs> I'm not going to play in the NFL or the CFL or the XFL <laughs> or any college or therefore you're right. Uh, but you know, that's just the that's just the truth of it. And sometimes it takes a level of discipline, and it it sounds romantic. You know, you're putting something in you know, that might be memorialized or become eternal in a way and outlive you and be a legacy uh, as part of that. And sometimes people do that with a really interesting memoir. Other people do that by publishing a book about business so they can use it as a marketing tool. You know, mm -hmm. in my realm, it's really about escapism and entertainment. You know, did my book entertain you? Was it fun? Do you want to buy the next one as a result of that? Uh, and so even though it's, it's, it's entirely divergent from what I used to do on a day-to-day -day basis, it's always something that I've had in me. And I knew that. And I think it took a while for me to understand I had the ability to do that. So like your fighter pilot, your lawyer, your neurosurgeon examples, all of those folks have to communicate daily at a high level in some way. In my world as writing as a lobbyist, I wrote grants, I wrote position papers, I wrote speeches, I wrote legislation. And so it, I was practiced in the art of writing. Now that was nonfiction, and in many respects, very boring and didn't have prose, it didn't have uh, dialogue, it didn't have pacing, it was arguments where you're trying to convince someone to do something, vote for or against or support or not support something. Uh, but it's the discipline that it takes to write every day that it, to be a successful author. And whether you're authoring a position paper or I'm flipping the script and I'm authoring something that's entirely fantasy, in this case, fiction, um, it, it's a, it, even though it's a different story, I possess the discipline. I liken it in many respects to going to the gym. You know, like once you go to the gym, you feel out of shape if you stop. You mm -hmm. feel like you're missing something when you don't, and it, you feel guilty. Same thing with writing. You know, if you're a writer, you can't write one day and then take two weeks off. You know, you lose the creative juice, you lose the track of where you're going. Sometimes things distract you, and you put it in a drawer and you don't touch it for two years. You know, this is something. You, there's a discipline that goes along with that, and I think that um, some uh, some folks have it in them, and and other folks want to have it in them, but might not have that ability to express it in a way where someone might want to buy it. And that's okay. Like if, if there's a lot of independent authors out there that publish for the sake of the art and you know, putting it out there and they don't care who reads it. It's just their story. And a lot of those stories are the best stories, right? And they take off a lot of independent authors um, in the last 10 years have done well because of the advent of Amazon and that marketplace uh, and other, you know, and it's hard to get published, right? So a lot of folks, their stories never get told in the way that they could in a robust way and to, to fill a marketplace. But for me, you know, I think, you know, even though people like to say that they've got it, I think everybody does have a story in them, whether it's a fiction or a nonfiction story. It's just a matter of, does it mean enough to them to put it on paper? Yeah, I love it. I, I think uh, we, in the end, we, we are who we have been, right? So I, I often say, you know, this is like my, I don't know, fourth life, because I had different experience, you know, from advertising and, and marketing to now, you know, covering cybersecurity event and talking about technology. But I agree with you. I mean, there, there is always often there is something that connects the, the different arts and the different discipline. And then you get the experience and then you can apply in a in a different way. It's almost like if you know how to play an instrument, it kind of come easier to play to learn another one, right? <laughs> or a language too. That's right. Yeah. That's so right. So 
tell me tell me a little bit because what is fascinating for me and for some reason i always get again attracted by this fictitious world that that you guys are able to create i mean i can talk about the harry potter you know the tolkien the shannara and uh, and i know you created this world as well which is gonna be apparently uh you'll tell us about that a, a video game which is pretty cool <laughs> and uh and how, how do you even start because it sounds so overwhelming to me like i kind of want to do that but i'm kind of like a short story writer or maybe because i started as a copywriter so i, I can condense something small but when i think about an entire trilogy it, i don't know i get overwhelmed by just the idea of doing that so how do you even scope that? Well, I think in part, it's the kind of writer that you are. There are folks that write really strong short stories or poetry or things like that. I struggle when asked to do that. And like my biggest fear is not writing a 150,000 word novel in epic fantasy. It's writing the 250 word blurb that explains <laughs> that on the back of the book. I just can't do it. I don't have that talent, right? So for me, you know, I've always been a complex thinker. I've thrived in planning and strategy kind of situations. And, you know, so when I look at the realm, I look at what Tolkien did. I look at what Martin has done. I look at what JK Rowling has done. You mentioned Shannara before Terry Brooks, all of the people that have come before me and they've created their own world and made it unique with several tropes that bind them all together that are, that are called fantasy, right? So I have my own magic system. I created my own pantheon of gods. I've created my own map so that you can see where the various cities and places of quests are going to happen and follow along. I've created a history for the realm. I've created various languages uh, for the realm limited, not like Tolkien who literally made a language. <laughs> Mine's a, a, a little bit less uh, uh, robust as his, but ultimately that's part of the fun. And I think that also helps when getting over writer's block. Because once you know how the story is going to unfold and you see how all these things come together, you know, in my day job prior to, I had to calculate how the winds of political change were going to hit my client. And in some cases that involved Democrat versus Republican or federal versus state or international laws, um, militaries, um, purchasing arrangements, uh, you know, contracting grants, all these things. And so, you know, for me, it was a lot of fun putting together the world and and then you see something and it becomes alive and people get attracted to it uh and i think that's why folks that read fantasy love series because you fall in love with middle earth or you fall in love with shannara and in my case i hope they fall in love with the realm of warminster and not only do they like the stories myopically of the main characters but they also like the stories of the regions and the races and the magics and the history that I've spent time putting together to to weave into what becomes a very fantastical, mystical, magical story, but one that's filled with adventure. And they feel entertained when they're done reading it and want to read the next. And I've created enough space to allow me to do that as prequels or also allow me to do that in follow-up series. Uh, and I think that that's always been fun for me. Now, I'm not saying it's easy, but it was fun. I spent more time doing that than I did writing the novels. You know, the, putting together the world took about six months to do. Writing the novel took about five, six months. And then now I write a novel once a right, three so, months. So here, here's the question. Do you, did you do that before? Like I, you say you like to strategize. So you're not the one that I'm going to start writing and let's see where it goes. I mean, it sounds like you know, you well, know where you're going. Although sometimes I'm sure... I can't that, do that. But I mean, I'm sure sometimes the character brings you somewhere unexpected. I, I like to think that they have a you know a life on, on their own as you write. But so so you did the, the 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 world you created before start writing? Yeah, I created the world and the way my writing style is is I write the end of the book first, then I go and write the, the beginning of the book and then I fill in the blanks in the middle. Uh, hmm. And that might be a little odd and a little reverse engineering, but it's a way to make sure that I have everything in the book when the book is done. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've done that for all four books in the series. And that way there's there's continuity. 
and I can also see when I'm missing something. I create, a, I have a whiteboard in my den where I write that has, it looks like a sweet 16 bracket in March Madness <laughs> with plot arcs and character arcs all coming together uh, into, you know, and then when I'm done with them and I know that I'm, I'm satisfied, I erase them off the board and what's left, I know I have to bake back into the novel, weave it in some way so that it makes sense because I don't want to leave it out. Um, and not a lot of authors write that way. Like you mentioned, there are authors that write by the seat of their pants that literally will get an idea from a song that they heard or a book that they were reading or a movie that they watched and they'll sit down and just start writing and then the characters will dictate where they go. I have some of that. You know, mm. some of my characters as they develop, if I start to write something and my editors or my beta readers recognize that it's out of character, they'll tell you. But for the most part, you're right. Like sometimes you think of, you, you know, the story is going this way and then all of a sudden, oh, this is a much better storyline. And you take it in a different direction or you, or you work it back around or you flip the order of it. And you're right. They do talk to you in many respects. I get a lot of that out of the way in the beginning. And I rarely do that on the fly. So once I get the story down in outline form, then it's just a matter of filling in the blanks. And that's where I've gotten much faster and much better at writing epic fantasy size novels based on the way that I do my planning. And now that I've got all of these things out of the way, so I know what kingdom they're in and I know what religion they believe in. I know what kind of magic they have available to them. And I know the history of the monsters in the region and all the, the relationships between all of the hard work was done. Then it's just a matter of connecting the dots. Right. And, and that's how my writing style is. I'm not saying it's for everybody and Perhaps it's only for me, <laughs> but but it works that way, and it's worked pretty well for the first four novels. Yeah, I mean, I I'm blown away by the fact that you started this uh, with the pandemic, and you already cranked four novels. You have an entire world. You have option. I mean, not option. I mean, it, it's going to be a video game. I, I'm, I'm from what I understand. It's pretty impressive. I gotta be gotta be honest. Now, I am definitely going to read is it an audible for for this yeah there's audiobooks for each of the novels right. uh, I'm, and I'm uh, I'm obviously e e ebooks <laughs> for people that like to read on their phones or yeah. you know on their computers as opposed to me who still holds the old school uh you know, hardback or paperback i prefer cool. that but i think that's just a matter of style yeah. but yeah audiobooks yeah. i think are important because it's the fastest growing segment of the marketplace People yeah, enjoy those it, because they can listen to them on the train to work or they, you know, doing yeah. laundry or it's a kid's game and it's a way for them to digest something that they might not be able to do uh, in any other way. And they can do it in five, 10 minute slugs. Yeah, I got, I got to say, I mean, I, I grew up loving reading. Then reading became pretty much academic book <laughs> studying and then it become, you know, be who you are. And but. But I also always wrote, love radio, being a you know an '80s kid. So <laughs> for me, it's easy to pay attention to just the audio. I don't need to necessarily read. And I kind of, I kind of like train my brain now, literally, to walk that dog and other two that I have, and consume at least an hour of a book every day on my walk, and maybe even later at night. So for me, it's become really really a major thing i mean i have probably the the biggest uh the, the more books you can get on amazon with the with a yearly <laughs> subscription um so let let let's talk about the the war minster uh realm because you got all this world in your head you play uh, Dungeons and, Dra and Dragons, which I'm sure it's a big part of being able then to do all of this. I mean, you've been <laughs> you've been doing this for a while, and then you you read all these books, and and then you go and create your own world. How? What makes you think in a unique way? Compare with, you know, instead of absorbing and, and regurgitating. Um, all these other worlds, which is pretty easy to do because we're made of those stories too. What, what What's your technique there? Yeah, so and first it's uh, what you described. It's really being a creative from a young age and being around a game like Dungeons and Dragons forces you to be creative um, in many respects. If you've never played the game before, it's not a board game. You roll dice, but that's just based on how your character reacts to certain things or is in combat with monsters or whatever it might be as part of that. But ultimately, it's a group delusion. 
that's centered around someone called a dungeon master, which runs the game. And that person has to be a very good verbal storyteller because they're weaving a tale to you like you're sitting around a campfire, except you're not just listening, you're playing. You're an active person in that delusion. And so as I'm telling you as a dungeon master what's going on, it's not much different than me telling you what it's like when I'm an author. The difference is in the book writing, it's very linear uh, and it's 100% the way I want it to go. When you're playing the game, you have to d react as a dungeon master and have enough creative skills to change the realm, change the campaign, change the scenario if players decide to do something you don't expect them to do. And even though you try to dictate a story to them, they often don't do that linearly. Uh, and that holds true for video games too. I mean, you can get into a video game and create your own avatar and then work with a villain if you want to. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to follow the lines of, especially the newer video games that give you the freedom to do that in, in AR and VR. So for me, you know, creating the realm was part the discipline it took to be a good dungeon master, a good storyteller, Mm -hmm. a good game master during those years. Um, and then it was a really borrowing from those experiences because I knew how my players reacted well or didn't react well to certain scenarios. So a lot of stuff that you find in my novels has been battle tested because it was played out, you mm -hmm. know, and I had veteran players who were really high end players tell me that they really liked something or they didn't like something. And if they don't like something, it doesn't make it in. And you're right. Like, there are certain things that I can do that are tropish, things that I can borrow from the granddaddy of them all in Tolkien. You know, but it's hard to not have your own realm with uh, with its own uniqueness without it being, you know, someone coming after you for copyright or trademark. So you'll not find anything in my books that mentions Dungeons and Dragons except for me thanking Dungeons and Dragons for helping right. train my brain to think right. this way. You know, but ultimately, learning from those that came before me reading and in some cases deep reading what they had done and then bringing that to the creation of that realm. So part of it is this storytelling that I've been a part of, whether as a player or as a dungeon master, coupled with these really cool stories of things that happened that we still talk about today. Grown men in their 40s sitting around a table at Christmas laughing about stuff that never really happened, watching our wives look at us cross-eyed saying, why don't you play poker? But instead we're playing Dungeons and Dragons on Sunday nights. You know, and, you know, and then being able to adapt that to, you know, uh, you know, writing and deliver that to other people so they can see it. And so I do have the tropes, like there's obviously magic and you see it sort of a, a you know, kind of what I would describe as a, a in many respects, a medieval society. Uh, but what I've tried to do is incorporate, you know, mythos from real world stuff and just put my spin on them. So some of my monsters, for example, come from Greek history or Native American history or Asian history or Nordic history, but you, you, you'll be familiar with them, but they're, they're unique cryptids, right? They're, they're my cryptids or my monsters, but they're grounded in some realism that you're familiar with, which allows you to adopt that from a fantasy realm. You need give, some give basis me, of realism. Give me an example. Give me, the, give me yeah. one example. So I have, I, I have a character, uh, a creature in my, uh, novels called a skin stealer. And in German culture, they would have called that a doppelganger, someone that has the ability to change to look like someone else's twin, a double walker. Literally, mm -hmm. that's what that means. Or mm -hmm. in Native American lore, it was known as a skin walker. And the idea was is that it had the ability to change its form from ghost to human. It could change from male to female, but it was an evil creature that had the ability to do this. So if I called it a skinwalker, the Native American community would really know a lot about what that was. Mm -hmm. If I called it a doppelganger, folks of a Germanic background may understand what that is. But I created a skin stealer. And in my realm, it's a magical oh, creature okay. that doesn't just make itself. It goes into your body, diffuses, and kills you, eats you from the inside, and then becomes you. So you no longer exist. And this creature has taken over your body. Or I have a creature called the Do you, do you breed that bird? It, does it come through your mouth? Do you breathe it in? I don't know. I just do I breathe. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a. It, they they literally. Well, it's, it. I'll, I won't be a spoiler here, but there's a no, way no, that no, they no, don't 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 ingest. Yeah, ingest the uh, their victims, uh, or uh, I, the antlered man, which is one of my more popular 
bad guys, he's based on a Nordic myth of the master of the hunt, where it's just a, a man who hunts with his dogs. In this case, he does, he has no dogs, uh, but um, you know he still hunts, and he's he 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 was turned into this creature by a magical curse that allows him to be part feral, but also maintain just the slimmest form of um, of who he was, his former self. Hmm. Uh, and so you, you learn to hate him, but you also learn as the story goes on that he's cursed and this isn't really him. And this was something that he fell victim to, uh, and which hmm. is entirely different than the Master of the Hunt story that comes from Norse mythos. But instead, it was something that looked really cool that I've adopted. And, you know, people enjoy telling me that they... They like to hate it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I can see some credit going towards your books uh, <laughs> very soon. It's uh, it's kind of like in my in my corner. Um, is what's what what's the let's say the if you have to do I don't know, you said you don't like to write short story, but if if you give me an elevator pitch for for this story, what what makes it unique? Like, how, how are you going to tell me, dude, you're going to love it because. Yeah, so sell it to me. It, it's <laughs> yeah, sure. No, in, in a 30 second elevator pitch, it is literally a chosen one versus a prof, pro, a false prophet story. The main character is a, a young man who learns to harness his ability of prophecy and he sees a fallen member, a cursed member of his of his order returning to take vengeance upon it and it's the magics that he possesses and the sights that he sees that allows him to combat the return of this evil man that you have to learn about in a very sort of luke skywalker um you know darth vader way or you know harry potter versus he who should not be named kind of way so if you like that kind of storyline where there's a redemption arc and do, do the villains take it or not Voldemort didn't you know, Darth Vader did, uh, and you've got this central character that you're cheering for, who's a bit beyond puberty, obviously he's a young man, uh, but one that is going on his, this harrowing adventure and is ill prepared for it. And it's how the realm and his friends come around him to support him in this and what they do. Uh, and so it's, it, you know, if you like that kind of harrowing adventure stuff, you, you're, you're really going to fall into, into the realm of Warminster and the, and the first keeper, or the yeah. last keeper, I should say. Very cool, very cool. It's kind of like that hero journey that that we, you right. know. I mean, it, it it inspires so many stories, but but that's the cool thing is like they they may follow because we're we're so in love with that, you know, the the growth of a character and the adventures. I mean, we go back to talk about you know Greek mythology, uh, you know the 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 Odysseo or Ulysses or you know even those stories they're all the they're all about that but the, yet you dress them in a different way you bring different character you make it your own and it doesn't really matter if in the end it's that hero journey because we just love it i mean you mentioned star wars uh, that's that's a typical example um right there tell me about as we start wrapping up although i could keep talking for the longest time about this um what's coming next i mean you yeah. First of all, a little. I, I'm kind of curious about the the translation. Actually, let's go there. Sorry, I mean, I'm kind of talking to myself. The the video game, right? I mean, when when you transform and rescript a book into a movie, there, you know, it's the book is always better. Or it's different. Of course, you don't have that many things in terms of pages and 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 trilogies available. You got to put it in an hour and a half if you're lucky. You do seven movies, like. <laughs> you know, Harry Potter or Star Wars. How do you feel about this coming up the video game? Is it like, are you working directly into the script of it? It's, is it the way you wanted to do it? Are you directing it? What, what's going on there? Yeah, none of the above. And, you know, I literally <laughs> impart, I am part of the storyboarding process, right? Mm -hmm. So what I learned early on in it is that it's a different medium and therefore they know how to deliver their story better than I know how to deliver their story mm -hmm. and to get out of their way. And there's obviously, you know, this is my baby and I want it to be done the way I want it to. But when you make a video game, 
players can choose to go in a hundred different directions. When you write a book, yeah, they're reading your story them. in one direction, right? And so what they have to think about is whether or not, what happens if a player doesn't follow the script? What if a player decides to work with the villain? What if a player decides to not do the quest and stay somewhere else? How do they get rewarded for doing that? Um, and so what I've learned is help them create guardrails. You know, stay within here. This is kind of the overarching story where it goes from the beginning to end and stay out of the way of the coders, right? Like, even though I might want, in my head, a character looks a certain way, they make it a different way. All I can do is give them the premise for it. And yeah. as long as it's 70% of the way there or 80% of what I want, that's mm -hmm. a win, right? But they, they've, they've paid for the right to adapt it in their medium. And that will bring me people that may not read my books but we'll play the video games that then come back to read the books Absolutely. because there are hints in the books to help them win the video games. Or, you mm. know, like you said, I mean, if it ever, if I'm ever lucky enough to have it into a movie form, people that don't like reading will see it in a movie and at least know my characters and know the storyline. It's not going to be a hundred percent true to form, but you know, ultimately it's, it's there. And um, it's just, I'm reaching out to another group of, of folks that I could entertain, even though it might not be a hundred percent of the match. As long as it's close and people get it, that's that's really what it's all about. Them having fun. Yeah, I, I love that because you said something about adapting to to the media and and the medium that you're using, right? I mean, you you can't tell a story as you say in the exact same way, even if you just read it or or look at it or listen to it. That there gotta be a way that you deliver it but it's going to be to the benefit of the story. It's not, I, I don't think it destroys the story unless it becomes completely, something completely different. But in, in general, adapting to the medium, it helped to, to maintain the core of the story, the message, you know, the vision in a way that, mm -hmm. that's, that's an humble experience too, I think, and, and letting other artists to take it to, to another level. Right. Yeah, it's it's both humbling and scary at the same time, right? <laughs> like, you don't want them to screw it up. It's your baby, and you want to be a helicopter parent. But by yeah. the same token, you the minute you recognize that you don't know what you're doing, yeah. then you you you're willing to get out of their way yeah. and let them do it because they know their 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 marketplace better than you do. They know their medium better than you do. Yeah. So but, you know, I'm not going to pick up a paintbrush and start painting. You know, someone that can paint can do that, right? That's right. not what I do. And it's it's a hard lesson to learn, but once you do it. It's both humbling and gratifying. Yeah, but the guardrail is important. Is it going to be a multi, like a multiplayer type of game? Yeah, it's yeah. going to be a, the first version will be augmented reality, so it'll very much be like if you've played Pokemon Go, uh, the the company Niantic that oh, um, is is dealing with that it's like that level of technology, and then the second iteration will be virtual reality, so it will be multiplayer wow. point of view, single That's point of view. It'll be through your eyes. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And uh, apart from the from the video game, uh, I'm assuming you're going to keep writing. There's no going back to to DC, yes. No. Yes. no <laughs> so no. what's what's Straight in ahead. your head? <laughs> what's in your yeah, head so we, for next? Yeah, book four, which is called Echoes of Ghostwood, will be the final book in the Warminster saga. Uh, and then after that, in 2025, I've got three books that are going to come out that are origin stories of the more popular characters in the novels. Mm. And then in 2026 will be the, the second series. It'll be a trilogy, not a quadrilogy like the first one was. So um, it's already, the next two years are kind of planned out. <laughs> you know, we'll see what happens after that. But, it, you know, by the end of 2026, video game, graphic novel. And at that point, we'll have four plus three plus three. What is that? Ten novels. And that's the mm. goal. That's cool. Uh, actually, I'm going to do one more question, which is, do you see yourself playing with different genre? Like, what do you what do you think about that? I mean, is it a good thing to is it a safety net to stay in what you know, or yeah? Or, so or do you feel I, like oh, maybe I can try <laughs> something else? I want to write a vampire novel or a series of vampire novels, but what's hard about that is. I'd liken this all the time. If Stephen King were to write a romance, it's a little bit out of character, right? And your readership likes you reading, writing what you write well, right? And 
I know there are folks out there that can do it and they can bounce around. I would love to write a vampire novel or a series of vampire novels down the road that are horror or some sort of like contemporary fiction. And I'll get there eventually and I'll cross that stream when I get there. But right now there's a comfort blanket like Linus's blanket from Peanuts that wraps around. It's just because I know fantasy so well. <laughs> yeah, just keep doing that. And, and so I'm going to be doing that for the next couple of years. And maybe when I get enough courage, I'll cross the Rubicon. But for right now, I'm, I don't. I don't have it in me. <laughs> I'm, I'm a, just, a straight line guy for now. Just we'll throw see. a vampire monster in in, uh, in your <laughs> arsenal, uh, and you start kind of like you know melting. Yeah, I got a good story. It's a nice exactly. little story that mixes like the gothic, more Stoker Dracula and yeah. Nosferatuish stuff with like you know Catholic Church kind of stuff, and it's a it, it would be a really good contemporary fiction novel with a little like urban fantasy stuff in there yeah. maybe that's close enough adjacent yeah. enough for me to to survive it but um you know in all honesty it's that's a couple of years down the road so we'll, oh yeah no 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 we'll I, I i i don't want to be the one responsible for you losing the focus on what you're doing i think i think <laughs> no, you got your right. you got your three years plan or two yeah. years plan ahead <laughs> stay on that i think is exciting i mean it's it's a lot of writer dream to be recognized immediately after a few years that you write uh and and you know already turn it into different different medium i think that's pretty that's pretty cool so john i really enjoyed this conversation um i could keep going like i said but i'm gonna kill it at 36 minutes which is about now uh thank you very much for everybody that i hope they enjoyed this conversation as much as i did you can find all the links to get in touch with uh, with John, uh, his website, and then there is another thing that I think we didn't talk about. You, you also have a like a magazine that you that you're doing, but I don't know. Maybe come back. We can talk about that another. I would time. love to. Yeah, happy to yeah. talk about all the reality mag anytime. So yeah, you have let, me back. Let, I'll be more let, than happy let, to do it. Let's do that. For now, we we end it here, and then maybe we do chapter two that we talk about other writers. Sounds great. Right? That well, sounds... thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure to come on. I really enjoy everybody else. Stay tuned. Uh, hit subscribe if you're on uh, on the YouTube channel or follow the, uh, the podcast on whatever player you're using because there'll be a lot more stories and a lot more storytellers. Take care, everybody.